How can we ever forget Tuesday, September 11, 2001? A nightmarish vision that left us paralyzed, stunned beyond belief, helplessly staring at our TV screens. How can we ever forget that Osama bin Laden and his Al-Qaeda terrorist network attacked America on its own soil, devastating its very symbols of economic and military might? In New York, the Twin Towers ripped apart by two passenger planes. Flight 93 entered a profound place in history when it became known that the passengers took on the hijackers. They literally sacrificed their lives, helping to provoke a crash in an abandoned field. Thanks to them, the terrorists missed their target. Then there was Flight 77, symbolically the most devastating blow dealt to America. The terrorists targeted the Pentagon, completely destroying a portion of the US military's headquarters. We still know very little about Flight 77. All we've had to go on are rumors, falsehoods, and conspiracy theories swirling around and influencing public opinion. The most common and outlandish of them all, no plane ever crashed into the Pentagon. And so Flight 77 has remained in a tangled web of history and a favorite game of those who make their living off of the world's woes. The commemorations of September 11 allow us the possibility of setting the record straight once and for all not to engage with conspiracy theorists, but rather to talk about the cold, hard facts and for the first time ever, give the final word to the victims, their families, their loved ones, and all of those people who investigated Flight 77. a.m. Tuesday, September 11, 2001. Thousands of people crowd into the terminals of Washington Dulles International Airport. Passengers checking in and boarding their flights. It's just another busy day at Dulles, with the exception of one small detail. At the airport's security checkpoint, the bizarre behavior of a group of men catches the attention of security agents. These men are held for further screening. But as international terrorism is still a rather foreign notion to America, security agents are not prepared for what is unfolding before their very eyes, and they fail to pick up on the warning signs. Despite the presence of knives in their hand luggage, the group of men coast through the screening process, then quietly blend in with the other passengers and board American Airlines Flight 77. The five Saudi-born men board the plane with a very precise objective. To take their seats in economy class alongside the majority of passengers. And the other three settle in first class, seated strategically near the cockpit. The five-hour flight was set to take off at 8.10 a.m. Destination, Los Angeles. The captain of Flight 77 was Charles Burlingham. He would have turned 52 on September 12. Before becoming an airline pilot, Burlingham was part of a narrow naval force flying fighter jets, an early passion that his sister vividly remembers. 
Chick grew up loving airplanes. I've got a picture of him as a baby holding an airplane. Uh, the first plane he built was as a six-year-old. He built it all by himself. He was a very smart little boy um, from scrap lumber that he find, found behind uh, the alley of our house in England, where we were stationed for a while. And uh, he built it as a surprise to my parents. Sarah Miller-Clark was seated at 25D. Sarah was a geography and mathematics teacher at a middle school near Washington, D.C. Divorced mother of two children, Sarah had a new lease on life and was engaged to John Milton Wesley, a songwriter. On the morning of September 11, 2001, John and Sarah got up at dawn to enjoy an early breakfast together. And we talked briefly about uh, what time she would call me and the fact that uh, she was coming back the following Saturday and she had left a jacket on the door, on the closet. And uh, I came in <clears throat> and I saw the jacket, a yellow jacket, believe it, a London fog, as a matter of fact. And I picked up the jacket and ran out to try and catch her and she had already gotten past the stop sign and, and she was gone, so. Sarah was chaperoning a group of children to Santa Barbara, California for an ecology conference sponsored by National Geographic. Photos were taken just before boarding, taken by officials accompanying the group to the airport. These were probably the last photos taken of the passengers on Flight 77. Twenty-two D and twenty-two F, three rows in front of Sarah, are Darlene and Wilson Flagg. They were both sixty-two years old. Darlene was a teacher. Wilson was a pilot and officer in the U.S. Navy. Wilson and Darlene are now retired, and a couple takes the opportunity to travel. Destination: California. He was a great person, larger than life. Uh, 6'4", 230 pounds. We'd go out working on the farm and uh, we'd work all day together and he would just bury me. And I was doing everything I could to keep up with him. So he was very strong. But uh, once people got to know him, he was pretty much a teddy bear. But he was very intimidating at first glance. <laughs> and, your, and your mom? She was sweet. Uh, like I said, uh, she could take care of everybody and do anything and she picked up everything. She was incredibly smart. She was a Menza and uh, very gifted, very talented. She could take a pile of junk and turn it into a piece of art that everybody would want. Three rows in front of Wilson and Darlene, Norma Sturley, seat 19D. Norma was a psychologist. She was 54 years old. The mother of two children took Flight 77 to join her husband, Eugene, who was currently in Asia. Well, I was uh, in Singapore. I was actually... Uh, doing uh, some work for the International Monetary Fund. My wife had decided to visit my daughter for a few hours before they both came and joined me in Singapore. So, and in fact, she had switched flights near the last minute so she could spend those few extra hours with my daughter. Karen Ann Kincaid was in seat 15D. Karen was 40 years old and married. She was a lawyer and law professor in Washington, D.C. She had always been very close to her brother. She was a strong woman. She left our small town of Waverly and went to, ended up in Washington, D.C., but she never forgot where she came from. Karen was doing work in Los Angeles for her company, her, her law firm, although she was actually scheduled to be on a different plane. One of her Colleagues requested that they switch. So Karen took that plane. Sarah, Darlene, Wilson, and Karen, and there were others on that Boeing 757, a retired couple from China to visit their daughter, a political consultant to CNN, a humanitarian doctor from Ethiopia on a return mission, managers, bosses, American Airline employees, officials based in Washington, D.C., and newlyweds Robert and Zandra Plogger, who were headed to Hawaii on their honeymoon. A total of 53 passengers, plus the five Saudis and the six crew members.
At 8.20 a.m., Flight 77 receives clearance for takeoff, 10 minutes behind schedule. But just as Flight 77 takes off, the Air Traffic Control Center in Boston is faced with a crisis unfolding several hundred kilometers north of Washington, D.C. A Boeing 767, also belonging to American Airlines, Flight 11 to Los Angeles, had taken off a few minutes earlier from Boston Logan Airport and had just been hijacked. It is 8.24 a.m. As Flight 77 reaches cruising altitude, the control center is receiving a message from Flight 11. We have several planes. Stay calm and everything will be fine. We are heading back to the airport. Nobody move. Everything will be fine. If you try to make the slightest gesture, you will be putting yourself and aircraft in danger. Just remain calm. Ten minutes later, 8.34 a.m., the second message. Nobody move, please. We are headed back to the airport. Do not try anything stupid. For now, only the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, is aware of this crisis. Otherwise, air traffic is continuing as normal. There is not yet an actual state of alert. No warning either at the Pentagon, the headquarters of the U.S. military, the nerve center of the Department of Defense. The day is just beginning at the Pentagon, where thousands of employees, civilian and military, are already at work. Among them, David Tarantino, a 35-year-old Navy officer. Well, it started like any ordinary day. I made my way into the Pentagon, but uh, it was a especially, an especially beautiful day that day. The sky was crystal clear and it was a perfect temperature and a day where you think twice about, oh, do I really have to go into work because it was so nice out. It was a gorgeous day that 30-year-old Navy Lieutenant Darren Pontel was about to enjoy. Married for six months to Devora. His night shift was ending in just a little over an hour. He was a very kind person. Um, he had a great sense of humor. He was, he was quite funny. He liked to have a good time. Um, and he just, he loved being in the Navy. He loved um, his work. He was an intelligence officer. He had worked um, aboard a ship, the USS Eisenhower, for um, a couple years. And he loved just everything about the Navy, you know, being with pilots, uh, working in the intelligence community. He was very proud of his accomplishments and his work. As Darren Pontel was preparing to return home, David Tarantino was just starting his day. That was when, all of the sudden, the turmoil began. And before we knew it, we were hearing reports that something was happening in New York and we had a TV on our office, in our office, so we were able to turn that on and start watching the coverage of the first tower having been hit and to start to see what was happening and really try and process it. And we couldn't, couldn't imagine at that point, was this an accident? Was it some sort of a terrorist attack? The personnel at the Pentagon had just fallen upon these dramatic images and were left dumbfounded. Eight forty-six. American Airlines Flight 11, hijacked by terrorists, some 20 minutes earlier, hits the North Tower of World Trade Center. A tragedy witnessed live on TV by the entire country. Someone came into my office and said to me, turn your televisions on, America's under attack. I had a meeting. I was driving about 90 minutes to this meeting on the radio. The announcer broke in with an emergency message that uh, a plane had hit one of the towers in New York City. There was a hole in the first tower at the World Trade Center. And I stood there for a moment, just kind of looking, and I thought maybe a pilot had just, you know, been flying low or whatever. John, Christian, Deborah, and the others never imagined at the time that what was unfolding before their very eyes could have directly affected their loved ones. Even on board Flight 77, there was total calm. 
The passengers had no way of knowing what was happening in Manhattan, and the pilots were never warned. The flight was heading quietly to California, to the other side of the country, far, far away from New York. At 8.50, four minutes after the crash of Flight 11 into the World Trade Center, the captain of Flight 77 sends a routine message to air traffic control in Indianapolis. But from that point, the events will begin to unfold. Soon after, air traffic control learns that United Airlines Flight 175 to Los Angeles out of Boston also has been hijacked. And just minutes later, Flight 77 will enter into the turmoil. In the passenger cabin, five terrorists are preparing to take action. Five Saudi men with very charged backgrounds. Seat 12B, Khalid al Midar, a person without a history? Not exactly. He's an Islamist militant. Next to him, Majid Moked, 12A. He was recruited two years earlier by Al-Qaeda, Bin Laden's terror network. At the front of the plane in first class, the Al-Hazmi brothers, Nawaf and Salin, seats 5E and 5F. They had fought in several wars in Bosnia and Afghanistan. Seat 1B, just next to the cockpit, Hani Hanjur. His place among his accomplices was not chosen by chance. He knows how to fly a plane. At 8.53, the five men rise from their seats. Each has a specific role. While two of them handle the passengers in economy class, the others at the front of the plane head to the cockpit, armed with weapons. I feel very emotional about what happened to the crews. People think of them as, you know, you know food servers and you know, the, the people who are pushing the, you know, your luggage around in the seat underneath you. But in fact, the, the, the crews are there and for one reason and one reason only, the safety. And that's what's drilled for them into training. And so the cabin crews, they died a pretty horrible death, um, knowing that there was um, nothing they could do to help their, their passengers. Um, but, the, but the pilots were all murdered very quickly. It is 8.54, a little more than 30 minutes into the flight, that's when the hijacking of Flight 77 begins. Were the pilots killed as quickly as the sisters' captain said? Most likely. Though what's certain is that the terrorists gained control of the cockpit, quickly took control of the plane, and immediately changed course, direction, back to Washington. At 8.56, two minutes into the hijacking, the terrorists cut off the transponder, the automatic device that reports the identity and position of the aircraft. Air traffic controllers lose track of the plane. Flight 77 disappears completely from the radar. I think my mother was in the, probably in the back of the airplane trying to comfort uh, the women and children were back there. I could just see her uh, caring for someone else in those moments. Uh, I know the FBI told us too there were some children close by her seat. Uh, I don't know. I just think of her maybe holding a child or doing something like that rather than uh, calling her husband. And he's even said she would not want him to have to play that final conversation over and over and over in his mind. I believe my father uh, went back to the back of the airplane and said, I'm an American Airlines captain. And he took charge of the situation. He would uh, be telling everybody, remain calm. You know, I'm a captain with American Airlines. This will all be over uh, soon. You know, try to keep everybody focused and try to find out what's going on and gain as much information as I can. What kind of information would the father want to get? The destination of the hijackers? Their demands? No doubt. After all, as in any hijacking, the hostages know that hijackers are there to negotiate. Death is not necessarily waiting for them at the end. So while scared, there was a reason to keep hope alive. 9.03 a.m., New York. Fire! 
Flight 175 United Airlines crashes into the South Tower of World Trade Center. I was actually in Los Angeles, um, and I got a call from my sister-in-law, uh, my brother Mark's wife, saying, Deborah, um, I'm sorry to wake you so early, but um, you've got to go turn on the television and see what's happening. And I grabbed my um, cordless phone, and I said, uh, I was walking, talking at the same time, what, what happened? And she said, I, I can't even begin to tell you, just turn on your television set. What was extraordinary about this attack is that it happened in real time. Um, millions, hundreds of millions of people watched it live on television. We saw the second tower get hit and we were pretty certain that this was obviously some sort of coordinated terrorist attack. And um, we just started to try and process what that meant for the military and for us at the Pentagon in terms of what response might be. And even wondering, will there be military targets as part of this, as part of this effort? And um, even thinking, well, it's strange they you know, didn't want, try to hit Washington, D.C. Or, or a major target here. David Tarantino could not even begin to imagine how right he was. Flying out of Newark to San Francisco, a fourth Boeing, United Airlines Flight 93, is also hijacked. It changes flight plan and heads for Washington, D.C., just like Flight 77. 30 minutes have gone by since air traffic control lost track of Flight 77. At 9.30, a plane appears on the radar in the control tower at Washington Dulles Airport. But what kind of plane is it? Air traffic controllers are perplexed. The transponder of Flight 77 is still cut off. No one could possibly know that this is the same aircraft that took off from there just a little over an hour ago. And this unidentified aircraft causes another problem. It's flying way too low at just 2,000 meter altitude and much too fast. By this time, it's only a few dozen kilometers from Washington, D.C. Given what just happened, there is now a reason to panic. Meanwhile, at the Pentagon, there is still not yet a state of alert. People keep on working. Gerald Paul Fisher, 57, has just arrived for his business appointment. Divorced father of two, Gerald worked for a consulting firm specializing in human resources, and he remarried his wife's name, Christine. My birthday was the day before, and we were going to be celebrating it that evening. So I went to work as normal, and when I got to my office, I had a bouquet of roses on my desk, which were from him. They had arrived a day late. so. <clears throat> I knew that they were going to be there because he told me, did you get the roses the day before? And I didn't. So, um, so we went, so I called him and uh, told him that, well, was going to tell him that the roses were there and thank you. And I didn't, I got his voicemail when I called the office. So that was about 9, 9.15. Gerald Fisher does not respond because he has already begun his meeting at the Pentagon. Meanwhile, nearby, two sisters are talking quietly, Patricia and Kathy. Patricia is a 41-year-old financial analyst at the Pentagon. She's married and a mother of a little five-year-old girl. Kathy, her older sister, is 48 years old. She's in charge of studies at the Pentagon. And so she wanted to meet with me. And so uh, I, it was about 9, 9.15. And I went out to meet Patty in an area of the Pentagon that's called Center Court. And it's a five-acre um, courtyard in the middle of the Pentagon. And we met out there, and uh, it was just, it was beautiful out there. We, I remember backing up a little bit because the sun was starting to come up. Um, but uh, we, we met out there. Her daughter had just started kindergarten, and she wanted to tell me about the events from that. And we uh, discussed, we both saw on televisions in our, very, our uh, different offices that something had happened in New York. 
Kathy and Patricia then get back to work. As usual, they would plan to meet up again later in the day. Confronted with the attacks in New York behind the walls of the Pentagon, many are already wondering how America should retaliate and against whom. Without knowing that, just a few miles away, the Pentagon itself is in the viewfinder of the terrorists. A few miles away, in fact, Flight 77 is almost back to its original starting point. Honey Anjor has taken over the controls and flies the airplane right into the Pentagon, the headquarters of the Department of Defense. Did the passengers have any idea at all what was happening? Most likely no. And now nothing can stop Hanjor and his accomplices from hitting the heart of America. At 9 hours, 37 minutes and 46 seconds, Flight 77 crashes into the west wing of the Pentagon. I heard a loud sound, very loud sound. It felt like an earthquake and there was a kind of a, a feeling of, of a big impact. Things came flying down the hallway. I went down to the floor and I just remember thinking, what the heck? What's going on here? I remember us looking at each other and just thinking, wow, this is unbelievable. First New York and now Washington, the Pentagon, this is much bigger than we thought. And then immediately sirens started going off and orders to evacuate the building. On the first floor, it was down the hall from Patty's office. So I stopped to look down that hallway and I didn't see anything. It looked clear. And I thought, okay, she's got to be out here somewhere, probably. And so my office wasn't immediately um, struck, but we were in the direct zone of where the aircraft came in, and um, we were actually just at the leading edge of where the aircraft reached. So I ran with the others out to what, the center court area again. We still did not know what was happening. Uh, I started looking for Patty, kept looking and looking, and I asked a friend to look for her. And then we started to notice the black smoke billowing from our office area up into the sky. Very difficult to breathe. So I had to get paper towels and wet them and hold them over my face and literally crawl on the floor to find people who were still in the impact zone. And there was this one large hole that had been blown out and we could hear some voices in there of people trapped who, who couldn't get out. I was one of the few people on site and so it, it fell to us to try and get those people out. Uh, the first agents uh, on the time log arrived uh, six minutes after the plane impacted. It was very emotional. Uh, so you suppress all those angers and you let your professional side uh, take control. It's hard to put into words, you, you know, when you're standing at something and it, the Pentagon's um, scene was, in comparison to the World Trade Center, much smaller. Um, but you still feel the enormity of it. People had abrasions and lacerations and um, flash burns and other burns and um, smoke inhalation. As we moved into some of these spaces you know, through this hole, we found other um, people who were um, deceased. It was very devastating. First, I didn't think anything of it when it was just New York because I figured he'd be busy and I didn't want to bother them. Uh, but then when I heard about the Pentagon, I thought, oh, I'll call the office. So I called the office and every line, every phone number I had was busy. So I just waited. I didn't know my sister was on that plane at that time, but I looked at my brother-in-law and I said, and we almost said it simultaneously, I wonder if Karen is okay. 
sometime in the afternoon we got a call from the Navy that said we're trying to account for everybody that was in the Pentagon. Have you heard from Darren? And I hadn't. So then I started calling all of his work friends. Um, people I knew he was working with that night, people I knew who weren't working that night, just to try and see where he could be. The Pentagon burning, Manhattan suffocating. At 9.59, the South Tower of World Trade Center collapses. A few minutes later, at 10.03 a.m., the fourth hijacked flight, Flight 93, crashes into a Pennsylvania field. Passengers rebelled against the terrorists and ensured that the plane missed its suicide target, most likely the White House or the Capitol. At 10.10, a part of the Pentagon collapses. At 10.28, the North Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed. America is in chaos. By this point, news outlets officially announced that Flight 77 has just hit the Pentagon. Friends and relatives, their doubt turns into a certainty. When I learned that, in fact, uh, it was Flight 77 from the news media, from CNN, that it was Flight 77 in the Pentagon and that it was burning and the whole site had been sealed off. Prior to that, we were told uh, 77 was a second airplane into the towers. And so that was the horrific images that kept replaying in my head all day long. At 1 o'clock, I received a call from a person from the National Geographic who went to Dulles Airport with Sarah to ask, did I know her flight number? And I said, well, I wasn't sure. She said, I think it was Flight 77, and you should call American Airlines. And at that point, uh, I said, how do you know? She said, well, I was at the boarding gate with her, and I really think it was Flight 77. And uh, it wasn't until my kids got home, and at the time they were, they were pretty young, and so they didn't really understand what was going on. All they knew is that uh, their grandparents were no longer there. At that point, I called American Airlines, and when I gave them my name, and they said, are you John Milton Wesley? Yes. Do you live at 5231? You know, yes. Would you please stay on the line? And at that point, I knew that something was up. After a long, long time, they came around and started um, releasing us to go home. And I thought, well, what do I do? <laughs> I walk. And we walked for about five miles. And uh, I remember stopping. <laughs> We stopped at one point to use the bathroom somewhere and get a drink of water, and I was saying prayers for my sister, make sure she got out. And it wasn't until later that night, as we were waiting and it was it was late, and her husband left to go to see if he could find out something about her. My sister, um, oh, my sister Anna spoke to him and recommended that we, we should go check. And so he went with one of his cousins. And I was laying there, the lights were out because um, their little girl was asleep and watching it on the TV. And for the first time, it struck me. I, I saw what was going on at the building and all I could think was, oh my gosh, I left my sister there. I should have waited for her. I should have waited for her. By the evening, very late, maybe 11 o'clock at night, they sent the military, the Navy sent um, a couple officers, a chaplain, um, and a couple officers over to talk to us and give us whatever information they had. 
we got a confirmation, then we got a negative confirmation, then we got another positive confirmation, and at the, by that time we 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 probably knew. I'd say for me it was it was the middle of the night, it was maybe three a.m. or something uh, in the morning when I when I when we sort of pieced it all together. got into the office, I was there talk. Of course, everybody was coming up to talk to me and telling me how sorry they are. Um, all of a sudden, I get a page that there was um, someone on the phone for me. It turns out it was my casualty officer. He said, Mrs. Fisher, um, I need to meet you at your house. Tell me when you can be home. This was at noon. I had only been in the office a couple of hours, and I realized what he was going to tell me. He was going to tell me that the identification had been made. In the hours that follow, families of the passengers of Flight 77 will be officially informed of the death of their loved ones. For the intelligence agencies, it's the beginning of a gigantic undertaking. Over a hundred FBI special agents are deployed to the site of the Pentagon to come through the crime scene night and day. The research will last five weeks. Initially, uh, when uh, Jim came on the scene, they did what they call a line check, where they just walked the entire perimeter, picking up anything that would have been of evidentiary uh, evidence, which was everything. There, there were quite a, quite a bit of uh, wreckage and objects, and, and at the time you wouldn't be able to tell if it was a file cabinet or if it was an aircraft part, but we had uh, National Security Transportation Board. They were on the scene with us. Uh, these people are very well versed in what aircraft parts are look like, uh, so every time we had a piece of, uh, of evidence that looked like it could be the aircraft, we would run it by these people. They would look at it and they would say, no, that's the aircraft, or that's a file cabinet, or that's a piece of wall that's, you know, uh, a piece of metal other than the aircraft. The, the main thing that we're, what our job is there is to collect evidence, to try and determine basically the questions even like reporters ask, who, what, where, when and why. And there's a process um, that you do when you collect evidence. This, the search of the Pentagon was kind of broken up into these categories of, you know, stuff that belonged to the Pentagon, classified documents, personal items of people who were sitting in that area, body recovery, and then evidence. I think everybody kind of has this snapshot. I've talked to others, and mine, mine is, um, and it's not really a piece of evidence, but it's something that kind of really stood out to me. And it was a sailor's cap, a white cap. And it was found in the Pentagon where there was the fire and things along those lines. But it was white. It was white like you just took it off the shelf. So it kind of was really like, you know, there were these odd things that stick out in your mind because they don't make sense. So that's kind of my, you know, recollection of something in particular. So. If you're getting into the remains and if you're getting into the, the horrific scene that was there, yes, we saw body parts, uh, we saw personal items, we saw personal items mixed with the wreckage and the body parts. Yes, we did. For me, one of the things that stood out was a woman's red high heel shoe because uh, it was a single shoe in, in a hallway area by itself. And did she drop it when she ran out? Was she in those shoes when she was killed? Is it something that was just blown out of a, out of a desk where she had shoes stored? Uh, you don't know the answer to it, but it was just such a stark color in that, that gray scene that, it, that, that stood with me. Um, 
you know, there were uh, just under 200 people who were killed in, in the uh, airplane uh, impact at the Pentagon. But we collected over 2,000 body bags of pieces and parts of, of, of the people that we brought out. And each of those collection stays with people. The people who worked in the morgue who were trying to document and, and identify the people, uh, those horrific scenes stay with them for the rest of their life. There's no way that they don't. Once this word completed, FBI agents are then responsible for personally delivering to the victims' families the personal objects of their relatives. The 59 passengers on Flight 77 and the 125 employees or visitors who were in the part of the Pentagon devastated by the crash. Evidence collected, identified and then given to families in a manila envelope like this. I would be able to show you Sarah's fanny pouch and, and her, uh, her tickets from, from, the, from the flight. Uh, that I was able to, to, to get in her eyeglass frames. I mean, the glasses, the glass was gone, but the frames uh, were still there. Uh, his uniform I didn't want back because it was contaminated. Um, and they suggested that um, we not take it back for safety reasons. But um, I did get his ribbons back that he wore on his uniform. Um, his Naval Academy ring, they recovered and gave that back to me. Uh, I think it was uh, two days or three days after 9-11 uh, when they were going through the Pentagon. And they found the wallet and the ring and they're both in uh, FBI evidence bag. Despite this huge undertaking, hundreds of items still remain unclaimed. And so investigators are turning once again to friends and family. And one of the things that we received, survivors received, is a book about this size. It's about 1,300 pages, which I will share with you, of elements and pieces and, and artifacts that were saved from, from that plane. The victims' families will immerse themselves in this directory of misfortune torn between the pain of being confronted with the death of a loved one and the hope of keeping their memories alive. Alongside this work, hundreds of investigators from the Air Force, based Dover, Delaware, working to identify the human remains through DNA. Following this colossal investigation that ends on November 21, 2001, only five of the 184 victims will not be identified. Four of them worked at the Pentagon. The fifth was on Flight 77. A three-year-old named Donna Falkenberg. She was traveling with her parents, Charles and Leslie, and her eight-year-old sister, Zoe. The Falkenberg family was headed to Australia. So one victim of the 59 passengers on Flight 77, only one will not be identified. Now that this process is complete, the families will receive a death certificate and a graphic autopsy report that includes a warning to the reader. Dear Pastor Kincaid, as requested enclosed within this sealed envelope is a complete copy of the autopsy report protocol in the case of your late sister, Karen A. Kincaid. I must emphasize that the information contained within this report is graphically described for complete accuracy in physical details of your sister's remains. I strongly recommend that you read this in the presence of people that can provide you with emotional support during this time, such as your minister, family friend, or counselor. Reverend Kincaid cannot read on any further. It's too much difficult. Here is the autopsy report following the warning. 
It details the remains of his sister Karen, found in the ruins of the Pentagon. Skull and Scalp with Hair A 3,560 gram aggregate of femur, upper chest wall, medial clavicle, and teeth. A left mandible with four molars, fragments of skin, and a portion of ear. A 30 gram right elbow fragment. A 750 gram aggregate of skin, soft tissue, bone, including part of left clavicle. A 350 gram of soft tissue and bone. It was surreal. It, that, that's the best way to, ex to describe it. The emotions that go through are, uh, it's hard to describe um, everything. People talk about uh, losing loved ones, and it hurts. It doesn't matter any age. When you lose uh, your parents, uh, it's still terrible. If they had died in a car accident, it would be a private thing or on their own. It, it would be private for the family. When it happens nationwide like it did, it's a national tragedy. The worst feeling for me, and I'm, I'm guessing it's very much in common with with, with everyone else who, is, who has suffered death, is, is that realization that there is absolutely nothing you can do for the other person who's died. I remember asking, why has this happened? So on my sister's plane, there were children, boys and girls, women, men, just going about their daily life. Why were they hated? Why would someone seek to do this? I remember wrestling with those kind of questions and then just the reality of it. I was searching constantly for answers, trying to understand, and I still am, why? You know, I tried to understand what was going on. I, uh, uh, you know, why would some people grow so much to hate other people? Hatred it makes no sense to me. To, to plot, to murder, to hurt, no. I, there's no reason for that. Well, they just wanted to kill innocent Americans. It's more, they didn't go after the military, they went after women, children, civilians. It's, it's, it is hard for me to comprehend anyone wanting to end their own life, um, no matter what it's for. I don't come from where they came from. I, I didn't walk in their shoes. I'll never be able to understand it. It was encouraged what they did. That was coercion and a, a pretty much a brainwashing uh, to come in and do what they did. They were totally uh, oblivious to the carnage. That said something to me about the psyche of this enemy. For the families of victims of Flight 77, the discovery of the faces of the murderers will be difficult to live with but it facilitates the grieving process. Who are these men who devastated so many lives? And what brought them to do this? The investigators of Flight 77 tried to provide some timely answers to these questions. Khalid Almidar, a native of Mecca, he came from a prominent family, married with two children. During the 90s, he fought in Bosnia and Afghanistan before settling in the United States in 2000. Majid Moked, passionate about sports and travel. He was a law student in Saudi Arabia. 
He had arrived in America in May 2001. The Alhamzi brothers were the sons of the merchant. The eldest, Nawaf, fought in Bosnia, Afghanistan and Chechnya. He came to the U.S. with younger brother Khalid Almidar. Hanian Jor came from a large, wealthy family. He had already made several trips to the United States where, among other things, he learned about flying planes. Superficial answers that failed to appease anyone and left many unable to understand what led to such extreme violence. The victims' families wanted real answers. You know, I wanted to know um, how had they been able to pull this off? How did they get in our country? Um, as you know, the hijackers were identified very early uh, in their photographs printed very early. They used their own names, and that uh, enraged me. Because I did not feel anger. I felt more surprise, let me put it like that, that, that people could be so naive that they could have the level of intelligence that they had and at the same time, um, not anticipate. Let there be no doubt in your mind. It was an intelligence failure. These guys, when they hijacked this plane, they, lose, they used their own names. Yeah. We had intelligence on, on Al-Qaeda. We had intelligence on the Tal Taliban. We had intelligence on some of the other more radical groups around the world and the kind of unique things that they were doing by this time. You know, we had had the bombing of the coal by this time. We had had the, the first bombing of the World Trade Centers prior to this time. That should have told the American government something about what we were facing. I didn't want more people to die. And so um, I, uh, yes, I was adamant that we had to open up the books and expose it all. Know every detail, reveal everything, but reveal what exactly? That America was caught off guard? But that much we already know, it was a lesson the US paid dearly to learn. To better understand the errors and the sequence of events that made such a catastrophe possible, if that is what people are expecting, then they'll have to wait quite a bit longer for that. For the moment, the focus is on the counterattack rather than the how and why. I was very glad when the United States went into Afghanistan and started attacks there. I think it was a month or two after 9-11. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. I thought it was a month or two too late. Um, I would have been happy with attacks on September 12th. Sunday, October 7, 2001, barely a month after September 11, the Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan is launched. What is the objective of this multinational military intervention? destroy Al-Qaeda and oust the Taliban to completely eradicate a major base for international terrorism. But all the while, as the U.S. military mobilizes, the victims' families in the U.S. will suffer a second attack, more pernicious than the first, but in some ways even more cruel. Rumors, slanders, lies begin to spread like wildfire, invading the World Wide Web, and they will immediately distort the tragedy of September 11. Example. Thousands of Jews were warned by Israeli intelligence not to go to the Twin Towers on September 11. Another example, the collapse of the Twin Towers and Tower 7 were said not to have been caused by the impact of the Boeing 
and the ensuing explosion and fires. They were said to have been mined with explosives at the behest of U.S. authorities. These rumors would gain the favor of people from all walks of life, originally propagated by America's right-wing and left-wing extremists alike. The rumors eventually proliferated around the world, including in Arab Muslim countries and even in many European countries. And with Flight 77, they will even take the 9-11 conspiracy theories to new heights. In this frenzy, a Frenchman will play a rather significant role. Thierry Messon, a former left-wing activist and environmentalist. He would eventually find common cause with the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah. In 2002, Thierry Messon wrote a book on September 11, entitled The Big Lie, a book that, under the guise of innocent questions, recycles some of the most inflammatory rumors, even suggesting that no plane ever crashed into the Pentagon. When asked what happened to Flight 77, his reply was, are these passengers really even dead? And if so, who killed them and why? If not, where are they? A 115 ton Boeing 757 with a 38 meter wingspan allegedly struck the facade and crashed into the building. This is obviously impossible. And the problem we have here is the way the FBI and the Department of Justice immediately identified the culprits. There really wasn't ever any kind of investigation, criminal or otherwise. The culprits were allegedly identified and they just went on the hunt for the accomplices. Such nonsense could feed into some of the conspiracy delusions found on certain well-known social networks on the internet. But in March 2002, Thierry Messon will do one better. He'll get his 30 minutes of fame on a widely viewed French talk show hosted by Thierry Ardisson. Everybody's talking about it, one of the flagship programs at the time of the France 2 network. You have a questionable guest, no one to contradict him, a popular host and a captive audience ripe for spreading disinformation. As a result, the show gets huge ratings and it transforms a web of lies into established truths and takes society by storm. The next day, there's a mad rush to get the book. We are open on Sundays. We had over a thousand requests, so if we had a thousand books, they all would have been sold. And then we sold between 500 and 600 per day the first four days, and then 150 per day over the past 10 days. It really is the book everyone's raving about. People have been calling us from Paris and 50 kilometers away. People were willing to drive 40 kilometers to pick up this book. I've never seen anything like this before. A hundred thousand copies will be sold in the weeks to come. With 250,000 books sold in France in all of 2003, The Big Lie will become the best-selling political book of the year. Nine months later, in a belated yet very telling moment of clarity, host Thierry Ardisson will offer a harsh self-critique in the French daily Le Monde. It was a lapse of professional judgment on my part. There is no other way to describe it. I should have never invited him on, and I should have immediately recognized that I had done something stupid. Too little, too late, the damage is done. The rumor thrives on rampant anti-Americanism and becomes a social phenomenon. But why? Why hadn't these images of debris filmed on the scene of the crime put these rumors to rest? Above all, why give Thierry Messon and his followers a public arena to claim repeatedly that no trace was ever found of the passengers of Flight 77 at the Pentagon? Yet it had been known for months that the remains of 58 of the 59 passengers taken from the scene of the crash were identified by their DNA. How could it be possible to dismiss autopsy reports provided to families like the pastor's sister Kincaid? An aggregate of femur, upper chest wall, medial clavicle and teeth, a left mandible with four molars, a 750 gram aggregate of skin, a 350 gram of soft tissue and bone. Nothing works. 
Neither the evidence at hand nor the pain of the victims is able to counter the lies, quite the opposite. The Big Lie is published in 40 countries. In the United States, it even comes out seductively entitled Pentagate, playing off of the legendary political scandal Watergate. Watergate involved in-depth investigations, while Pentagate is based solely on Thierry Messon's conspiracy theories. Flight 77, he wrote, never hit the Pentagon, it was a missile which basically amounts to telling us that behind this crime against America is America. For this modus operandi, you just need a few people to execute the entire operation. Everything depends on the procedure. And again, we do not know. But if it truly was a missile that struck the Pentagon, it would not have required many accomplices, just a few people, high placed in the military with the codes to activate the missile. It will take tremendous work to find out what really happened. For the moment, we are only at a stage of assumptions. But all assumptions lead us to believe that the terrorists were not foreigners, but Americans. As long as we live, we will live with conspiracy theories about 9-11, just as we live with even more conspiracy theories about the Kennedy assassination. It's just not going to go away. It's a bit of an industry. There are people whose livelihood depends on conspiracy theory. Uh, they want to continue to write books and make videos and, uh, and pay their bills. And so I say they're, they're not going away, not because they have evidence of a conspiracy, but because they, um, they, uh, they need it for their livelihoods. And for a lot of people, it's just fun. It's an interesting way to spend time, to imagine what might have been. You know, the world of 24 and Jack Bauer, maybe it really exists and maybe that's what went on here. These are the same people that, that believe that the Holocaust didn't happen too. I don't believe any of that. that. That's all nonsense. Because, you know, when you, it took me two months to find the remains of Sarah's body. You have to feel the pain. You have to experience the person walking out of the door and not coming back again. You know, you have to sift through the bones and ashes of, of, of thieves in order to find your, your loved ones. You know, you have to see the painting that she put on the wall and the shoes that she wore and her closet. And you have to see that she is not there. In my case, in, in my brother's case, I can't even begin to tell you how enraging it is. I heard of those, I got letters from people, even pages saying our own government had deceived us and lied to us. That was very difficult for me. Uh, that's not true, of course, it was hurtful to me. We know what the facts were and we need to deal with those, with those facts. So all the conspiracy theories and things, no, that, that added a burden to me. I'm an airline pilot. I'm also a former Navy fighter pilot and an accident investigator. I know what happens to an airplane. I know what the damage is. They need to learn a little bit what's going on and understand things instead of believing everything that they read or see. And the U.S. authorities did not waste any time responding to the conspiracy theories known as the 9-11 truthers. For example, in June 2002, at the press conference at the Pentagon, Victoria Clark, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs, took this opportunity to respond to the claims that no plane could have hit the Pentagon. It's disgusting. You know, over three, th we're coming up, it's amazing that almost a year has gone by, and we're coming up on the anniversary of a day in which over 3,000 people were slaughtered. And there are over 3,000 families and countless friends who are still, you know, in shock and their lives in disarray because of what happened. There is no question, there is no doubt what happened that day. And I think it's appalling that anyone might try to, to, to put out that kind of myth. I think it's also appalling for anyone to continue to give uh, those sorts of people any kind of publicity. Do you find it insulting? It's, it's much more than insulting.
I, I still get people ask me that they don't believe that an airplane hit the Pentagon. And I say to them, well, you can continue to believe that, but I spent four and a half weeks picking up airplane parts. So you can believe people who weren't there that have these ideas because it's not as clear to them, or you can believe somebody who was there. And just leave it, kind of leave it at that. There are, there are always stories like this that come out in any major event. There's a, a movie released in the United States this summer about the conspiracy theory of, of the Lincoln assassination from 1865. The, there have been conspiracy theories since there have been people. And, you know, there are people who don't believe that men ever walked on the moon. When we handle any sort of investigation, even the Oklahoma City bombing in 96, uh, I mean, there was all sorts of conspiracy uh, theories on that. It was it was the, it was our government. We did it to ourselves. I mean, you know what? You, you handle your investigation, you, the task at hand, in, in, in the most professional way you can. The end result is as, as to what what the outcome is, how we do business, and and how uh, we have brought many many people to justice working in that 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 manner. So that speaks for itself. It, it's not our job to convince somebody who has a theory or has written a book or has a TV show of anything. Our job is to collect the evidence, find out what the truth is, and present that in a court. And that's the job. Despite these clarifications, the truthers refuse to give in. They act as if none of that really happened. Denial of the facts and of the victims, politicizing and re-victimizing the doomed passengers of Flight 77. After a moment of stupor, the families soon forget. These rumors are so far from reality in the end that the families decide to just put it to the wayside and ignore it. What they take seriously, however, is the actual tragic event, and they want real answers to questions they've been pausing for far too long. In March 2003, under pressure from 9-11 families, the Bush administration finally accepts the establishment of the 9-11 Commission. Composed of 10 members, 5 Republicans and 5 Democrats, the Commission would conduct extensive interviews and testimony for a year and a half. The intelligence community could have, and in my judgment should have, anticipated an attack on U.S. soil on the scale of 9-11. And so the commission will point to the failure of U.S. security and intelligence, including the NSA, the FBI, and the CIA. The departments in charge of airspace security will also be put in a hot seat. You know, for example, with the FAA and NORAD, when you had them looking at different radar pictures that didn't line up, so they couldn't even describe where things were to each other. Evoking the response to the hijacking of Flight 77, the Commission will then literally rip apart the official version given at the time from the highest level by President Bush and Vice President Dick Cheney. With respect to American 77, the official account was that the uh, government got word that the plane was hijacked and they scrambled fighters from Langley Air Force Base in Virginia and, and directed them to Washington to try to meet that flight as it was heading back towards the, the Pentagon. Um, and they were just too late, just narrowly missed intercepting that plane. In fact, American 77 disappeared from radar uh, when it was hijacked. They did it, they did it again. But the, that, the, the FAA was confused about where it was. They didn't know it had been hijacked, they just knew it was missing. Um, and the military didn't receive uh, any notice that the plane was hijacked at all. They received word that uh, the flight was missing shortly before it hit the Pentagon. The official version, which basically had President Bush issuing the authorization to intercept the planes, um, that authorization didn't come from the president, it came from the vice president, and it didn't come until 15 minutes after the last plane was down. So the fighter pilots were never passed the order to do that because there was, there was nothing to do at that point. And it was a failure of bureaucracy. It was a failure of how government agencies work. 
Uh, it wasn't just a failure of the military to respond or the FA to respond. It was a failure of the entire government apparatus. Finally, the report submitted by the committee would conclude a collective failure of all U.S. government agencies that in the end allowed five terrorists to hijack Flight 77 and three other kamikaze groups to board and hijack three other planes that would lead to mass death and destruction. It's a terrible thing. I think there should be uh, accountability. And it's very clear that there are certain human beings who made really dreadful mistakes in the months leading up to 9-11 and should have been held accountable, should have been fired, should have been disciplined. And as you say, nobody was. You know, To this day, nobody was fired uh, for their mistakes before 9-11. Nobody was disciplined for that. And I think that leads a lot of people to believe we're, we're living in a time of no-fault government, that uh, we can't hold individuals in our government accountable even when they make you know, just terrible mistakes. Nobody was really ever held accountable. And even if light was shed on many important points, justice was not really served to the victims. Everyone will just have to live with the revelations of the commission and deal with this one terrible fact. America failed to protect its people. I miss her. I think about her every day. I know I'll see her again, but I worry that as a country we've kind of forgotten the lessons that we learned because uh, on September 12th, churches were full here. It's like we had a wake-up call. Uh, people turned to the Lord in that difficulty. Now it's just kind of that complacency has settled in again. You know, what my husband has missed is, is um, his son getting married the year after. He's, he's missed the birth of four grandchildren uh, over the past um, seven years. There's been, each, each of his children has had two children. And, you know, family events, he's, uh, he's missed a lot. I feel that, um, I feel that I'm taking his place whenever I go to any you know, birthday party or any celebration or another baby is born, um, that I feel he, he's missed a lot. I think that there was such a focus on New York that the Pentagon and um, Pennsylvania uh, weren't talked about as much. And that was, uh, that's upsetting to many of the families. I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but um, you know, when you would turn on the TV and someone would refer to 9-11 as, as the day the World Trade Centers, you know, the Twin Towers were attacked. And that just was like a knife, right, you know, right in your heart, like, and well, two other places were attacked as well, so why, why aren't they being mentioned? One of the disappointments was how people quickly forgot. And what amazed me is how could they forget it? Our whole way of life changed. Everything changed after September 11th. And just at the very moment we were to meet with some of the victims' families on May 2nd, 2011, the news broke. Osama bin Laden was killed. The Al-Qaeda leader was taken out during an assault on a villa he long occupied in Pakistan, and so we solicited their reaction to this major news event. Still hard to believe. <laughs> hard to believe it took 10 years. It closes one part. It closes the part about the, the you know, the people that caused the attacks. Um, but again, it doesn't make it any easier. Um, it doesn't make me miss my husband any less. Um, and it doesn't make his death any easier to deal with. I was uh, stunned, really, because uh, I, I stopped thinking about bin Laden. I wasn't sure if he was still alive or not and I never wanted him to dominate my life. So it was like an old nemesis who was back in my, in my universe again. And um, I was very happy to hear that he'd been located. Uh, I was happy to hear that, they was, that he was killed. And it brought back a lot of bad, bad, bad memories. 
I was satisfied that justice was done, but I was not elated. I didn't understand uh, the celebration and uh, the parties that were going on because it was like, this is one man, this is not over. There is more to this than the, just this individual. Yes, we got the head guy, but there's still the number two, there's the number three, there's a whole bunch of other people ready to take his shoes and carry on. And uh, what I'm waiting now for is to see how they are going to retaliate, because they will. I had wished that we had captured him as opposed to killing him. Now, I know the, the, the judicial and the world and the, and the diplomatic situation that would have created had we captured him alive. But I would like for them to have captured him alive and brought him to America, or taken him to a world court. Despite his Spain and solitude, John was never filled with resentment and revenge. Today, he still composes songs, and when he composes, Sarah is never very far away. I'm so glad to have you in my arms tonight. The angels will surround you In my arms tonight so Kathy still seeks out her sister Patricia. She no longer works at the Pentagon, but she still goes there regularly, at the foot of the building where the flight crashed, where a memorial was built. Hello, Patty. It's hard to believe it's 10 years almost, Patty. I'm sorry I don't get back here as often anymore. It was easier when working in the building. Oh, but I miss you so much. <laughs> Eugene spends much of his time at his foundation, dedicated to humanitarian and social issues a foundation he created and funded with the $2 million paid by American Airlines as compensation for the death of his wife. Your eyes tonight So if I lose my Flight 77, a journey that lasted just over an hour, waited with memories that will never cease to haunt the victims' families. Sarah's belongings among the debris. You're in my A photo of the final boarding. Karen's official autopsy report. A file that compiles the disaster. Officially, the black box from Flight 77 revealed nothing. Yet, it contains a message that the United States still hears to this day. The unthinkable happened because the fanatics took advantage of a certain national pride. America thought to be invulnerable until the country experienced the most deadly, devastating terrorist attack in its history. If I'm overly romantic, that's no reason to panic. Hey, I'm just that glad. I'm just that glad. Hey. I'm just that glad You're in my arms Tonight Ah, oh, tonight 